That is cool. The Element of Fatima, November 2020, Chapter 6.1 The ghost of Fatima haunts me like the creeping chill of winter and the subject of her is for me the most daunting of them all. The memory of Asya in her white and golden Egyptian regalia, maternal warmth and eternal courage crept into my life like the rays of the spring light gently pushing through the clouds and giving hope. The truth of Jesus' mother shone steadily like the unapologetic summer light that blazes in the clear blue sky and prevails regardless of what happens below. Exploring the life of Khadija was like appreciating the cooler breeze of autumn and finding a softer light, gently stroking through red foliage as leaves nourish the ground below. But now it is getting dark and cold. The shadows creep in with certain events that have already taken place, begging to be addressed. So, on a seemingly unrelated topic, I took up learning Oza recently and continued to learn Hivs, Hivs coming from Haviza, Haviza, which means to protect. It is the memorization of Quran, and ironically the film with Denzel Washington, Book of Eli, demonstrates this as he plays a blind man who memorizes the King James Version of the Bible. He could recite to the other writers after he escapes an evil leader of a town who wanted to hijack it and twist it for his own purposes. A Muslim who memorizes and recites the whole Quran is called a Havith, a protector because they can burn the books but not the truth retained in the men and women who memorized it. My teacher often refers to the struggle of wrestling with certain sounds as a fight because it feels like a fight. While battling with Qaza and its ancient cliques and the many variations of Arabic, Arabic pronunciation rules, I have also been learning a lot about digital skills regarding funnels and websites with endless fiddling and troubleshooting, as well as brain health regarding learning disabilities, and I've taken an interest in different galaxies and solar systems recently. I've been learning things like the largest galaxy, IC1011, which is also the oldest with lots of did stardust making it yellow and its black hole has a di diameter the length of Jupiter and the Sun. Technology is so advanced that if you go into YouTube then you will find lots of content from astronomers showing the panoramic surfaces of various planets outside our system as the one that's been eaten by its own star and another planet made completely of a diamond while another is just water surrounding a burning ball of fire. I could go on. It's a heavily extensive subject and I can't tell you what it's like to watch a universe-sized comparison and listen to al Mok at the same time. The more I learn, the more I go quiet and the more I realize how little I know. It is 2020. Everyone has their opinion of Trump, celebrities in China on social media thanks to fake news, while well, I know that none of them are as they seem. The only people I respect are those who are open-minded and who are willing to change their minds because the reality is that no one knows anything. Only God knows. For the rest of us, fumbling, stupidity, and sometimes arrogance. So... I keep, my, I keep focus on my life and the studies in front of me as there's nothing I can do about everything else. And of all the subjects that render me small and feel like I'm always on the precipitous of overwhelming information, would you believe that the subject of Fatima is as deep, as expansive, as complicated, as downright frightening, if not more so than any other subject to me? I probably have messed up with the other woman because only for God is perfection, but for the rest of us is progress. I will probably mess up with the story of Fatima more than the others because although she is the most recent in history, there's a lot of controversy and differences of opinion regarding her life. All I can do is my humble best with all the tangled knots of information I received. I pray that Allah accepts my best intentions and I seriously pray for guidance regarding the subject matter. Amen. If you do find any faults in this chapter, then know that this has been very challenging and I may have bitten off more than I can chew on this one. But I'm going to be brave and keep going. Bismillah, ready, steady, here goes nothing. Fatima was a very young Fatima was very young when her lovely mother Khadija passed away. Peace be upon her. Apparently she spoke to her mother in the womb, and there's a variety of interpretation to this. But I think we can at least appreciate that having the likeness of her father's gentle nature compared to her mother's warmth and sense of lo of loyal supportiveness, it's therefore safe to assume 
there was a stronger bond than usual. She had lost her mother at a very young age and was the fourth girl and youngest of all her siblings, whether they were biological or adopted. But they had all moved out to live with their husbands. Most of them married around the age of 10, which was common in those days, and their husbands were only a few years older and already working. There was no standard school system or age requirement for jobs back then. You got married, started working, and had babies as soon as you were able. Peace be upon Fatima's father, who would let encourage more education for females of any age, stressing that the mother was the child's first teacher. As a result of her adopted or biological siblings leaving home, she was exclusively with her father and witnessed not only her mother's death, but also her father's intense sadness over his wife. It was said that he was so grief-stricken and depressed over Khadija's departure that his followers and companions became very worried as it looked like he could die from a broken heart. If it wasn't for his prophethood, they would have assumed him to be suicidal. Either way, they were understandably concerned without the need to be. Fatima experienced this with her father and had to witness him coming home with signs of assault on him, which resulted in him, in her nursing him. In addition to this, they experienced extreme poverty and restrictions, thus a variety of distress from starvation to lack of clothing and other essentials. They also had a natural sense of anxiety or concern for their other companions and followers who are sometimes going through worse. It's a lot for a little girl to go through. Poverty is like a punishment for a crime you didn't commit, they say. This despair was outside their home. This was not the type discussed by Mr. Locke in previous chapters. This is unnatural and it's a man-made construction completely ungodly. I'm not talking about the lack we see among tribal people in their loincloths because that's not poverty. That's man naturally living off the earth and who is self-sufficient with his hunting and gathering skills. I'm talking about people living in towns who must beg and struggle just to eat. People are poor because they live in a system that strips them of their natural skills and doesn't compensate them for it. It's like keeping animals in zoos and not giving them food. You could release them in the wild, but they would die quickly due to their lack of survival instincts. We zoo and circus animals are very dependent on our masters to throw food our way via the employment system and feeding schemes. And we must remember that only the devil promises poverty. There are a variety of leaves, herbs, plants and succulents that contain medicine and nutrients that we are not aware of. Examples are spikebom and its intense level of vitamin C and its profound ability to purify the air better than trees in the rainforest, skeletium and its positive effects on ADHD, anxiety and autism as well as CBD and hemp with all its various uses. After being colonized by many pharaohs, we have been standing in cement prisons of urban society, blocked from our primitive cultures and roots well bred and conditioned for the labor system. Those indoctrinated to be dependent are on a slippery slope of destruction and lack. A cycle of abuse develops. The lack of funding leads to a lack of food and a lack of nutrition that leads to a lack of health and therefore sickness which further affects the capacity to work and makes people vulnerable to further exploitation, leading to more stress, which negatively impacts health and the ability to problem solve, leading to more desperation and possibly drug abuse to, medi to medicate the meltdown, which renders people more vulnerable to crime and blocks them from intellectual development and advancements in education and so on and so forth, etc, etc. The world loves to kick a dog when it's down, as anyone who has hit rock bottom will tell you. Speaking of people who hit rock bottom, peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad and his family, his daughter knew hardship. They said every daughter adds a little sparkle to her father's life, even in his darkest hour. Fatima was named after her grandmother, and it was a common name. It means to wean or weaned. All words have power, but more so with the ancient languages and the languages of the Prophets. Hebrew or Aramaic and Arabic. These languages are purer and therefore more intense. It's for this reason we prefer to pray in Arabic and are extra careful with what we name our children. Fatima was literally weaned so well from her mother, watched her, fa watched her death, and then watched her father grieve for her as mentioned before, along with their extreme poverty due to sanctions and the constant victimization they rendered from lack of tribal protection over the next few years. She did such a good job taking care of the home and him that she was nicknamed Um Abi, mother of her father. Not only was she active in terms of practical work, 
but was also a source of comfort and they developed a very close emotional bond as a result. She was the real preacher's daughter. It was just the two of them, their family and his followers against the larger population of nasty people. There was one incident where even the children were throwing rocks at him, causing him to bleed. I'm pretty sure this happened more than once because Khadija found her husband in this state. Either way, he always checked himself and questioned what he did wrong to provoke such anger. This was a man who was a traveling salesman and trader. The nature of a successful marketer or advertiser is to evaluate the effectiveness of his communication and how it matches the audience's understanding. Ministry and missionary work are different because the message isn't being directed to people who are looking for the answer, and so the response is sometimes not only rejected, but met with aggression and extreme defensiveness. Sometimes people get physical, and again, if you study the history of torture by Amnesty International, then you will find a few, ca a few case studies, and you will find more so in the Bible. This theme is heavy in the Quran, which was also sent to Fatima's father and his followers for reassurance regarding this. But it was in his nature to self-evaluate with a forgiving and tolerant spirit. He patiently continued, but there would come a day when he would respond differently, because courage is fire and bullying is smoke. As we know, Fatima's father frequented the Kaaba, that the prophet Abraham and his son built, peace be upon them all. He would stand and pray with his wife behind him when she was alive, and another young man who wasn't there that one fateful day. The idol-worshipping pagans mocked him as he faced the square house with its four sides intending to pray to one god. Abu Lahab, later known as Abu Jal, was the main instigator and leader of the bullies rallying against him. He was chief, leader, top elite, and very wealthy. When scholars describe him, I'm reminded of the frat boys who get bailed out by their rich parents and suffer no consequences for their destructive actions. You know the type. The jocks who push the weaker nerds into lockers or throw younger kids in garbage cans or dunk heads in the toilets as a joke. Abu Lahab had this pathology, despite being much older and being the uncle of Fatima's father. He was stuck in arrested development and hadn't matured much in his later years. If anything, he seemed to morally and ethically regress. Like a gang of self-absorbed high school brats, they stood and observed the father of Fatima in quiet sincerity, praying before the Kaaba while devising various plans and pranks to pull on him. Peace be upon the same man who bravely persisted despite their torment and heckling. He never knew what they would come up with next. Abu Lahab got the idea to dump the intestines of a camel onto him while he was in prostration, but none of them were strong enough to carry the innards of an animal weighing a thousand kilograms and throw it on his back. So he asked one man who was known for his massive size and strength. I forget his name and I'm not going to bother looking it up as he's not important as a person in history. All you need to know is that some big hulk from the cool club took massive piles of camel innards and dumped them on the back of Fatima's father while he was in prostration so that he couldn't get up and was stuck with his face to the floor. We can only imagine the blood, bile and feces with all its vile stench dripping onto the sacred space of his prayer mat and himself while being pinned down. He would have felt the heavy pressure of the load and the pain from the weight pushing on his back and cutting off his circulation. The intestines of the camel are connected to the three stomachs and other digestive areas that are linked and are therefore not inclined to fall off him but keep him trapped under various interlinked organs. It would have been a disgusting and painful experience in addition to the further humiliation of the laughter from the popular clique, looking at him with those slit eyes of mean satisfaction. Look at this man praying to God, look how helpless he is to our power and control, who does he think he is to challenge us and our ways. We showed him who's boss and who runs this place. Peace and blessings be upon the man who was struggling to grasp for air, cringed in pain and probably gagged from the stench while overwhelmed by the verbal taunts. He struggled to wriggle out but couldn't get free. He couldn't get home to his daughter who was alone waiting for him, but one of his fellow followers saw what happened, and due to his lowly position was not able to assist him without serious reprisal. 
So he ran straight to the prophet's house and told his daughter what happened. Here's another quote. My dad is awesome, but you know what? Like father, like daughter. So with that out of the way, and before we continue, I just want to point out that I did some research on the insides of a camel. That it is as tall as the average door. It might have weighed between 600 to 1,000 kilograms, as already mentioned, but couldn't find the weight of, of its organs. People don't normally weigh the insides of animals to make that information accessible through Google. Regardless, it was all heavy enough to keep a grown man on the floor. As mentioned, it had three stomachs, and the digestion goes through a lengthy process that causes the urine to come out syrupy and its feces to come out dry and powdery. So although I'm not sure how much its insides weigh, I did manage to Google the average weight of a 9 or 10 year old girl in a well-fed western country to be about 30 kilograms. Fatima would have weighed far less than that due to being malnourished from the sanctions against her people. This lightweight little girl quickly slammed the door of her home and rushed to the Kaaba breathless to find her father as described trapped under the very thing your average 5 or 10 year old wouldn't want to deal with. Girls are so squeamish and easily disgusted but Fatima bravely pulled all the intestines off her father tearful and stressed. She, she stuck her small fingers into the various organs and pulled them off bit by bit into various sections. Given the size and weight of the camel's insides in comparison to herself, this must have taken such a long time because she also had to detangle the organs and intestines while pulling them off. How did she feel going through this? I've heard a scholar say that she cried angry tears and fired off some heavy words at the perpetrators who were still watching bemused. She had no fear of these big powerful men of Mecca and no problem confronting them. I found this other quote to help set up the next part of the story. It goes, Caution, tempering with my daughter is hazardous to your life. The average dad. How did her father feel hearing his baby girl cry while peeling off all these revolting things? Did he feel powerless and defenseless to defend not just himself but his family? This carried on for a while. He was dependent on his own child to free him from the crushing weight and as soon as everything was off him and his prayer mat, he finished his prayers and rolled his mat to be washed. His back would have taken strain from so much pressure after much His back would have taken strain from so much pressure after such a long period. She then walked with him home with her nervous system in shock. Peace and blessings be upon the man who helped an old lady load by moving her belongings and heard her talk trash about, quote, this man called Muhammad, who was starting all this trouble and dividing people with his preaching, end quote. He happily continued to help her and assisted her with a sweet smile while listening to her further complain and moan until, when they were eventually finished, she asked him his name. He told her that he was Muhammad, the very same man she was referring to. She immediately testified after witnessing his enduring patience and forgiving nature that he was indeed the messenger of God and that there was no God but God. Dawood once be Ali Dawood once be Ali sings a beautiful ballad on this which can be found on YouTube under Don't Talk to Me About Muhammad. It's a very poignant song. Peace and blessings be upon the man who had a neighbour who hated him due to his cause so much that she would dump he Peace and blessings be upon the man who had a neighbor who hated him due to his cause so much that she would dump her trash outside his front door. Then one day she didn't do so, which prompted him to go next door to see if she was okay. This is the Muhammad that the French government and certain uncivilized citizens try to illustrate through pathetically immature caricatures of their imagination. They can never illustrate or mock him because they don't know him or what he looked like, but they ridicule themselves by splashing their ignorance all over the place. You cannot insult Muhammad, whose very name means praised one, and who was mentioned in the original Bible before further corruption as Ahmad, by Jesus upon whom there is also peace. Muhammad is in the past tense, and Ahmad is more present or future tense, both having the same root in the word Hamida, to praise or be praised. Peace and blessings be upon the man, who was evergreen in his love and mercy towards mankind, regardless of how he was treated, and he would have heavily chastised 
the events of Charlie Hepburn and the events relating to the ignorant and delusional school teacher being savagely beheaded in recent headlines. And while certain Sufi practitioners like to undermine others and make religion and worship difficult with overly complex quotes from obscure saints and leaders that are ranked on various unattain unattainable levels of their philosophical pyramid schemes and degrees, peace and blessings be on the best of men who simply said just be kind and advised his followers to keep faith simple and be consistent while trying to create ease for others. The same man who made everyone feel like his best friend and no one spoke to him and left without feeling a great sense of closure. Such was his loving and engaging nature. A wise old scholar once said, There are always different groups fighting each other and fractions of various schools of thought competing in various religions. So we don't always know who's right, but if we do good and be kind, then we can never be wrong. So again, just be kind. But now getting back to that day when his daughter witnessed her father in such degradation and had to spend a long time pulling all that un unspeakable filth off his back. Let's just say that you would have to really make a prophet of God angry for him to curse you. You would really have to earn his wrath, really upset him and really earn his prayers against you. I can't emphasize enough how much this incident was the final straw that broke the camel's back, no pun intended, since it was parts of the camel on the prophet's back. But I digress as always. And I believe that his anger came from deep hurt, that his own baby girl was so directly affected by their actions. Instead of checking himself and praying to be better, or praying for them to have guidance and then forgiveness as he usually did, instead he decided to pray against those men involved, especially Abu Lahab. He was led and met with a terrible and gruesome end. It reminds me of that Pulp Fiction character quoting the English Bible because this next part is like a scene from a Tarantino movie. I've heard other variations about Abu Lahab, but I will share this version for now. To cut a long story short, Abu Lahab's sister-in-law from his other brother as well as his brother's slave embraced Islam. So it was his brother's wife and slave sitting with him in a tent while his brother was fighting in the Battle of Badr. Some years later, with the other pagans against the growing community of the Muslims, another elder chief, Abu Sufyan, returned and told them that the Muslims had won. His brother, with some others, had been captured, and despite their small numbers, seemed to be accompanied by these massive men on the battlefield. The slave excitedly said out loud that these big men were the angels of Allah. With that, Abu Lahab started to beat the slave and was thumping him to death, but his sister-in-law in stealth picked up a tent rod and clapped him hard through the forehead as if batting or swinging a golf club. He flung back and lay on the floor with blood gushing from his cracked skull. She stood over him with the rod. Do you think he doesn't have a protection because his master isn't here? She said. There are other versions, but I love this story for three reasons. One, it was a woman who sent this man to hell. Two, she did it, saving a man's life. And three, this noble lady was real ghetto about it. I couldn't stop smiling after I heard this story about Lubaba, the great aunt of the Muslim community. As part of his curse, his corpse was so revoltingly decayed that they had to pay men a lot of money to drag him out of his house with sticks and push his gross body into a ditch. But all of this happened much later. For at this point of the story, he was very much having the upper hand and it seemed that it was clear that the situation was going to get worse. It has been said in response to immigration issues that no one leaves home unless home is in the mouth of a shark. At this point, their violence and aggression increases until it became obvious to anyone with common sense that they had to leave as their lives were clearly in danger. People in Myanmar were victimized for a long time before they were finally heavily pers persecuted and viciously driven from their homes. We can't and shouldn't expect the situation in Palestine to improve and many Jews saw the writing on the wall. We can't and shouldn't expect the situation in Palestine to improve and many Jews saw the writing on the wall in the ghettos under Nazi occupation before being sent off to the concentration camps. Women in abusive relationships have similar hope for the humanity of their abusers. 
I think between history and Allah telling us that the earth is big enough and thus encouraging us to move, I think we should take this as a lesson to not allow ourselves to get stuck in abusive relationships but to go on hijrah if the situation calls for it. Some scholars have written books and deep articles about the spiritual merits of immigration for the sake of Allah. This tends to overlap the theme of escaping brutality because let's face it, all abuses, whether they are spouses, bosses or governments, think they are gods over their victims. While the Muslim camp under Muhammad and by his direction were planning their exodus from the pharaohs of Mecca, they too were planning. Peace and blessing be upon him. Peace and blessings be upon him. They were planning to get each member from each of their tribes to stab the Prophet Muhammad in his bed while he slept. If each tribe was involved, then no one would be exclusively responsible and no one would be available to exact revenge. But Allah plans best, and his messenger got wind of this intention. Peace and blessings be upon Muhammad, who had a great cousin named Ali. He could graciously embrace the chance to lie in his bed while he escaped with Abu Bakr, so that the attackers would be delayed and not immediately set out to go after him. Both knew that Ali would be fine, so much so that Ali claims that God blessed him with the best night he ever had. That Both knew... Both knew that Ali would be fine, so much so that Ali claims that God blessed him with the best sleep he ever had that night. When they all came in with their daggers over the bed, he woke up and sat up to look at the men, looking back at him confused. According to one Sunni scholar, he casually flipped over the blankets, hopped off the bed and walked past them while they were still getting over the shock. According to the Shia, he jumped out with his sword and only one dared to challenge him and lost. They set off, but he hid in a cave with Abu Bakr that was miraculously concealed from enemy view. Soon they reached the town of Medina in the north. According to one view, Fatima left with the mother of Ali and her sister, with her eldest sister still in Mecca, with her husband, and the second eldest went with her husband to Abyssinia, Africa, since he was a trader and knew the area. The mother of Ali's name was also Fatima, since it was a common name, and she had no hesitation in embracing Islam when it was introduced to her. I think there may have been some back and forth which would explain why Ali was an escort to the woman, but he may have also come later. I think there may have been some back and forth which would explain why Ali was an escort to the woman, but he may have also come later by himself after sorting out the affairs of the Prophet that he was entrusted with. Finally, he crossed the terrain until he was personally and joyfully embraced by his cousin, who raised him like a son, his mentor and brother in faith, the blessed prophet of peace in Medina. And with that, a new home, new adventures, new memories. Fatima might have been roughly the same age as Miriam when Miriam became pregnant with her son, and his age when he escorted his mother to Egypt and back, according to some sources and Allahu Alam on all accounts. Her adopted or biological sister Zainab in Mecca was an Her adopted or biological sister Zainab in Mecca was in an awkward situation and it was tense despite the protection from her husband, who was a good man otherwise despite his allegiance. Fatima, the rest of her family and her father Medina were embraced by the newly converted Ansar who, as their name suggests, were helpful and great towards their, their migrant brothers in faith. Ironically, I have heard one or two imams talk about... Ironically, I have heard one or two imams talk against democracy, whether it was a Sufi sect consolidating a following for their sheikh, perched on his pyramid throne or another visiting a local mosque which is usually positive towards the democratic system. Irrespective of many from the minority from within the Muslim community around the world who are against democracy, the truth of the matter is that the Prophet Muhammad was selected by the majority of Ansar converts to Islam along with his immigrant followers from Mecca. It is from this point of view and considering democracy that we can appreciate that It is from this point of view and considering democracy that we can appreciate that anyone who isn't Muslim and who wants to rule over them 
will either try to hijack the religion and distort it to justify their position or just try to get rid of people who won't agree and prevent the faith from spreading if it undermines them. Let's conclude with another quote. I am a princess, not because I have a prince, but because my father is a king. Said by the average daughter, because here finally Fatima, her family and her community of believers found a haven far from the danger and deprivation of Mecca. The city of Mecca was originally founded based on a deep faith in God by Hajar, established by her men upon birth there is peace, but now it was a source of persecution to God's believers. Fatima went from watching her father abused and then observed him honoured and embraced as the leader. As the apple from the tree of his goodness, she emulated him in not only attractiveness, but in her new role as a hard-working and dedicated teacher, moral coach, guide, consultant, and minister in her community, especially among the women folk. Her hands-on approach and work ethic didn't lessen, but she maintained the pace parallel to her father's devotion to his cause. She became well-known for all her great qualities and being the daughter of the most beloved leader of the town, but more specifically as someone so close to the adored prophet, it was understandable that she was sought after later, with her father receiving many proposals by suitors seeking to get closer to him, as well through marital ties of kinship. Two of his companions, Abu Bakr and Omar, two of his companions, Abu Bakr, and Omar specifically asked him, and he said that she was too young, even though many girls that age had married. But he was understandably more reluctant and attached to her due to the death of his wife and the fact that his other children passed away or were already married at that point. Fatima's father smiled with a warm hint at those offering proposals and said that he had someone else to bind for her. Someone very special, someone already mentioned in this chapter and the previous. You're about to find out how special he was, if not just a little bit more. And you will find out how they came to get married and have children, and how noble Lady Fatima, the daughter of the great prophet of peace, became a humble domestic woman and stay-at-home mom, despite her political rank and status in the community, to be continued. Inshallah. And with that, the winter just turned to spring.